Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our third webinar in the How To series. Today, we're going to be talking about micro platforms. Uh, so, just a brief introduction to Red Badger for those of you who don't know who we are. Um, we're a digital consultancy focused on the digital transformation of large companies through innovation and delivery expertise. We have a proven track record of being catalyst for change, and we help our clients to navigate the open source revolution and be bold with their tech choices. Um, we really, really believe that technology should be as invisible as possible to enable you to focus on delivering business value. By being tech agnostic, by choosing the right tech for the job, and being meticulous in engineering practices, we enable continuous delivery and enable you to create value for your customers quickly. We love exploring new tech and the problems it can solve. Um, and microplatforms is one of those things that we've been investigating for a little while. So today, that's what we'll be talking about. Um, so, background really, lots of our clients are trying to break down their monoliths and take a new microservices approach um, to move applications into the cloud. Uh, in our experience, well, in your experience, not mine, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a very hard job to do properly. Um, but we believe it's a very valid approach um, that makes the process a little easier. So today we're going to talk about a bunch of ideas um, that have been proven in the industry um, and we believe based on our experience that combining all of these has some very useful advantages. Um, so quick introductions, Stu, who's our chief scientist and one of our founders at Red Badger, and Victor, who's a tech lead, and both of them at the moment are um, on this journey with a very large financial services client of ours. So, They've got a lot of uh, experience in this field. So let's start from the beginning then. Um, I know we're talking about micro-platforms, but what do you mean by a platform? Good question. So uh, the dictionary, <laughs> we'll start with the dictionary, um, says it's a raised level surface on which people or things can stand, which I think is quite appropriate actually, because um, we think of a platform as a set of tools and automated process that allows us to test, deploy, scale, and operate um, a digital product. And the important thing is that it abstracts the complexity of the underlying hardware and networking and, and software that you need to run a digital product into easier to consume concepts, so that it enables a team, a cross-functional team, to fully own and manage their product without thinking about the underlying hardware, software, networking, and all the infrastructure that's important for that. Okay, that's great. Well, that's a good start. Um, so what do we do, well, what were the challenges that led us to look at platforms in the first place? What did we do before then? So, yes, yes, in, in, in the history, like let's say 10, 15, 20 years back, um, we built the applications that we built today as, as big monoliths. Um, they were a single code base built into a single application, deployed as a single thing. Um, that made them um, very difficult to change and extend because there is nothing enforcing any boundaries inside them so everything could be connected together and it often was um, and it was fairly difficult to run maybe on your machine because it was a bit too big and it was very difficult to scale and make, make reliable because you kind of want to scale into little pieces individually but it also had benefits um, it was one thing which is much much simpler to understand than many things um, so you could test it all together and, and be sure that it works and, and you could deploy it as a single thing and validate it and it, it would work. So um, it's not all bad. There were often, these monoliths were often deployed onto pet servers, um, sort of hand-built, hand-crafted, hand-managed, looked after, they had names in the data centre, there weren't that many of them so it was possible to do it. Um, and admins knew them intimately. Um, and configured them manually, and you know that caused a few problems, but it was mainly successful. Um, but of course, then deploying was a big job, and so um, maybe you deploy monthly or even worse than that. We had, we had once had a client that had a, a six-week development cycle and an eleven-week release, releasing and deployment sort of hardening um, cycle. That's seventeen weeks. That's not even for a year, um, and so. Associated with that, those big releases, um, was a lot of risk. There was lots of change in there. Um, change that developers couldn't even remember what was in there because it was so long since it was last deployed. Um, a lot of process associated with it and change management and stuff, which made it really, really tricky. 
And it was made even more tricky by the fact that oftentimes it would be different teams caring about the different stages of, of um, the development and deployment process in the sort of waterfall manner. So you would have a set of people designing the solution and a set of people developing it. They would have to hand over between themselves and they would hand over to people to test it. Um, then they would get back bug reports and fix them and then eventually hand it over to someone to deploy it. Um, those people would also need to interact with environment team or something to know where to deploy to. And then finally, when it's all, all done and dusted, it would hand over to operations people who would take care of it as it runs and deal with incidents, often by turning things off and on again. Um, <laughs> and so he needed a lot of documentation and communication in order to, to get this process to work, and things would slip through a crack. Like we're all familiar with, with silly mistakes and errors that, that you hit on the web, that you check out on an eShop, and in the middle of the checkout process it just breaks and nothing happens. And like, how is that possible? How did no one notice this? Yeah. Oh, okay. Where are we now then? So, these days we tend to build microservice applications. So, um, lots of little services that constitute an application. And I often think that a microservice should be about the size that one person can fit in their head. So they're quite small um, and very domain specific. Um, so these, they have bounded context that like, enforce um, that separation. Um, and most importantly, they, they can scale independently. So each service can be scaled um, independently of the others and, and evolve independently um, on its own roadmap. So this encourages like an evolutionary architecture, which is a great thing. Um, but they're often complex and difficult to manage. I mean, once you've broken your application up into lots of little bits, you've got lots of little things now to manage instead of one. Um, and versioning is a big problem. So this version of this service has to talk to that version of that service and that, that version of that service. And managing all of that when it becomes large is quite difficult to do. And so we have things like service discovery and configuration management to help with that, but it's still a challenge. Made a rod, rod for our own back. <laughs> <laughs> and, and because we have that many services and the applications grow beyond uh, the capacity of a single machine, we now run them on, on sets of servers, like tens if not hundreds of servers. Um, and these are often still manually provisioned and configured by hand, and you can imagine what that leads to. We have a name for it called configuration drift. Uh, where people make changes to a few servers because something broke but they have no record of it and, and you can't replicate it on the others. Um, and uh, we run, run these applications either on the servers as they are or in containers and it's probably worth talking about what containers are. The technology of choice today is Docker and it's essentially a way of making each service look the same. Uh, the, the analogy of a con shipping container is quite a good one. It's a thing that has a standard shape and size and all the tooling is set. To, to work with that shape and the size and deploy things and scale them and replicate them. Um, so it makes it much easier to work with whatever's inside the container. You don't really care, it's just a box. Um, so the best case, I guess, today is, is cloud infrastructure, um, which can be automated because it has cloud has a set of APIs and you can put automation around it and make it immutable, which is quite interesting because that means no humans are allowed in and all the changes um, can be done in the code that describes the infrastructure and then you just recreate a new one. Um, and this allows us, and allows us to deploy much more often, like weekly, daily, several times a day. Um, continuous deployment, um, even continuous deployment into production, we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, but And applications can be built and managed and owned and run by cross-functional teams um, because all the infrastructure and the, the, the deployment targets are all automated. To, to enable all of that, like the current platforms that people run applications on are quite, quite complex machines. And they're so complex, in fact, and, and such a big investment to build it. They're often built by separate cross functional teams that just own the platform piece, sometimes as big as all of the product teams combined. Um, and it's difficult for everyone because all of the product teams depend on that one platform team and, and if they need a new feature on the platform they queue like everyone else. So it creates this this organizational coupling and queuing that slows everything down. Okay. Micro platforms then. What is a micro platform? Um, <laughs> well it's a smaller version of the platform that <laughs> Victor was just talking about. Um, a set of concepts together in one place like um, they work really well with monorepos, so maybe we should look at what a monorepo is before we 
talk about my platform. A monorepo is like where all of these little services are all sitting side by side in the same GitHub repository. Um, so what that allows us to do um, is to have atomic commits across um, all the services. So each service will be on its own uh, evolutionary roadmap, effectively a different level of maturity. Um, and across, like the developer will commit across all the services. So you could, you could even change both ends of a, uh, you know, of a, of a call um, at the same time because it moves forward together. Um, and so the commit shell becomes the version number across all of the services, mm -hmm. and that means we have like a minor version effectively. Um, so this really helps with the versioning problem because we can take a commit shell, say that's our version number, and it will cut right across all the services, and we'll deploy a selection of those services, and that forms an, an, an application. Um, and we can deploy that selection of microservices to a Docker cluster, um, and we can do it idempotently as well. So we can just push. Can say to the cluster, this is what we want it to be, this is the commit shell, and all the services, some of them may not have changed. Their version number has changed, but they haven't changed, um, and so they won't get updated. So only the services that have actually changed will get updated, um, which is quite cool. It's a bit like React, but for application deployment, um, where you can just declaratively specify to the cluster, this is what we want our application to look like, and it makes it that way. So in order to do that, you, you need to um, write down the orchestration or choreography of the microservices that form an application as code, and and that lets you do do what you just described, um, because it says here are my services. That's this is their names. That's how they refer to each other. Here are the configurations that, that are important for this particular application, and then you can deploy those um, multiple times into different clusters. And from their perspective, they don't know what environment they're in. It just together they all work and it's a, it's a larger concept around all of this is the, the as code um, so you get the application source code as code where the service orchestration as code which sort of makes the microservices into a monolith again and you get the benefits of having one thing to test one thing to deploy um, the build itself as code with docker files and provisioning of infrastructure with terraform cloud formation um, and the deployment automation with something like jenkins called circle ci um, so this means we can deploy our application as a whole to a micro-platform, and the micro-platform can be run anywhere. It can run on a laptop, mm -hmm. can run on-premise, can run in the cloud, any cloud provider. Um, and typically we'd have a, a fairly longish lived production cluster. Um, when I say longish lived, maybe a week, you know, we, we, don't want it, we don't want these things to live forever because they need updating and patching and all that sort of stuff. Um, so you do blue green to sort of like swap, swap them out, um, and also to have like quite ephemeral, sorry, ephemeral, <laughs> ephemeral um, <laughs> non-production clusters. So the lower environments potentially you just create them on demand as in when you need them. So for you may create one for doing performance testing, or you may create one for doing um, penetration testing, even because they're all identical, and so the results of one can be translated to the others. Um, and um, you may create environments just for each open pull request or whatever, and as many short lived as many as you want, um, because they're all automated as code. You can stamp them out and create them as whenever you need. And because they are this easy to, to create and, and maintain, uh, they can serve and be managed by a single cross functional team, which means the team then has the ownership of the application itself, but also the platform it runs on. Um, and that gives you numerous benefits. They get the features they need. And also the, the blast radius is very small. And, and one way of thinking about it, which is, which is actually a, a soundbite from one of our clients, it, it's a way for a developer to run a full production environment on their laptop. So I think sums it up quite well. That that's a capability that you sort of lose with, with the current platforms that are complex and mm -hmm. live somewhere in the cloud. Um, so typically this would be like a Docker in swarm mode cluster or a Kubernetes cluster. Um, and that Kubernetes is becoming like an industry standard. Over the last few months it's become adopted by all the major cloud providers and they're, you know, they're all providing a managed service, um, which is great. And that gives us some portability as well because if we, we know that if we can deploy our application to Kubernetes, we can deploy it to any Kubernetes, whether it's on-premise, on a laptop, and whatever cloud provider. So the automation 
um, gives us immutability. The containers are immutable, effectively. We just create and destroy them. We don't modify them in any way. Well, then get modified in the source code and rebuilt. All the, all the environments are the same. They're, we idempotently um, deploy to them. Um, so that makes the, the whole thing much simpler. Mm -hmm. That's essentially the driving concept behind all of what we're trying to do is to simplify everything. And by simplify, means we sort of mean decouple. We know that's a good idea for code, to not have much coupling between different pieces of code so that you change one thing and suddenly something somewhere else breaks that you didn't expect. Um, so we want to decouple code, but we also want to decouple organization so that teams are independent and you can scale horizontally and add more teams and nothing really breaks anywhere. Um, the infrastructure is decoupled from the application and, and immutability is a form of decoupling in a sense. It's essentially decoupling from time. The values just exist without time and if you, if you make them into a state that's suddenly coupled in time, and tomorrow the thing is not the same as it was yesterday. Mm -hmm. But a number five is always a number five. Well, I mean, all of that sounds brilliant, but what's really the value then for developers and the business and the customers? What, what do they get out of it? So, all of this enables continuous deployment into production, CDP. Um, the difference between continuous delivery and continuous deployment is the fact that continuous deployment like, has no human gates. So, every merge to master, every pull request that's merged into master will get into production if it gets through all the Test automated testing in all the environments and all that sort of stuff. So we have to have high confidence in our environments and, um, and sorry, in our automated testing to make sure that there is high confidence that everything's working well. But that continuous deployment into production is probably the single uh, most enabling thing for a team to do. Like that, teams that are doing this are at least twice and maybe even as much as an order of magnitude more productive because they're continually trickling features into production and that's continually making the application better and better and giving more and more value to the customers um, this and this in turn makes developers happy because that's what they want to do right there's a, a, we exist in order to be able to deliver value and this allows us to concentrate on doing exactly that and the interesting thing is when you describe this concept to organizations used to deploying once every six months, everyone freaks out. So deployment every day, twice a day, ten times a day, that, that's really scary. But if you think about it, the, the shorter the times between deployments get, the less change can fit into that time span. You, you can only make so many changes in ten minutes. And therefore the, the risk of the changes goes down as well. So the, the, the more often you deploy things, the less risk there is um, connected with the deployment. And we also should probably say that, that by deployment we don't necessarily mean release to customers. There are techniques um, that let you deploy changes of the code to production without showing anyone, like things like feature flags. Um, and by getting this speed you also reduce all other kinds of risks. Because fixing forward becomes just as easy as rolling back uh, and you can adapt to, and, and fix problems really quickly. All those changes are fresh in everybody's head because they're then only 10 minutes worth of yeah. changes. So yeah. it's easy to know where it went wrong when it actually, if it goes wrong, so you can fix it quickly. The mean time to recover is very, very small. So the killer question then, what are the downsides? There aren't any. <laughs> <laughs> no, there obviously are, are some because all we've, all we've talked about um, so far were stateless services, things that take some data from somewhere, transform it in some way and send it somewhere else. And you can have that as many times as you like. It doesn't matter which one of those copies does the job. And so that's really easy to, to, to manage because you can also turn them off whenever you like if there are others. The, the difficult ones are services that have state that manage some data or a piece of information that you take about customers or um, whatever your business is doing. And that makes it significantly harder because this is real data that you've got to look after and make sure that it, you know, it's safe and secure. And so, typically in a microservices application, some of those microservices will be stateful and they'll have their own data, database and that's often encapsulated within the service. Um, and if that's deployed to a cluster, then you've got um, state. And you can do this and you can make it work really well, um, but, you, but then that service becomes a pet, it's not cattle anymore. Mm -hmm. And so it has to be looked after you know, a lot more um, carefully. One, one technique is to actually turn that pet into into cattle cow <laughs> um, by by moving the state out of the of the service and and putting it in a like database as a service something like uh, DynamoDB or RDS or something like that so that 
the actual state management is uh, is somewhere else. And then that pet now is cattle and can be scaled, is stateless and can be scaled horizontally and, and deployed in exactly the same way as it was. But it's hard. I mean, like working with state and making sure state that changes over time, it's. Uh, that's, that's the most difficult thing. But we tend to think about it as, as like try and get the state towards the edges of your application, yeah. uh, not all over the place. Yeah. Thank you for that. So uh, to the floor now, any questions, um, please send them through to us. Um, alternatively, you can uh, ask the guys after this session. Their Twitter hands are on the screen now. Um, our first question then that we have is, uh, hi guys, um, I, I'm starting to look at breaking down my monolith, but I'm not quite sure how I start. How do you pick a good candidate? So I guess a good way of doing that is to find a piece of work that the monolith is doing that is sort of self-contained. There would be seams in your domain um, where things sort of naturally split apart. A good candidate would be, say, uh, an address lookup in a, in a form that you fill out your address. That is a self-contained piece of functionality that doesn't really depend on anything. And you can split that out into a service and then make the monolith use that service instead of doing it itself. So gradually picking up pieces of, of the big thing moving them out. Okay, so if that's the case then, do I need to think about potentially reorganizing my org structures? That's a good point because the way organizations tend to think about delivering software is as projects, so it has a start date and an end date. The people who delivered it then pick up and go and do something else. And with, with the microservices and, and sort of domain oriented um, development, you kind of want the team to own that thing forever, from, from cradle to potentially not even grave, maybe it will just live forever. And they become the experts and they improve the thing over time and understand exactly how it works and it's just a bounded context. So the, the team structure starts following the domain. Conway's law. Yeah. So if you want your application um, to look a certain way, you know, it follows the communication channels within the organisation. So um, structuring your organisation around domain boundaries really helps each cross-functional team is responsible for a specific domain. But to your reorg point, it's probably not a good idea to do that as a, as a big bang thing. Now we're teams. Just start with one, see how they, how they operate and what needs to change in order to support them. Because typically you have a lot of process in the way for those teams to, to be actually autonomous and cross-functional and self-contained. So it will take quite a lot of work to actually move to that model. Software is soft um, and should be mouldable and malleable and we should be able to mould it like clay effectively and, then, and so then we, you can imagine how you can just break little bits off and gradually sort of evolve it into, some, into a complete thing. Mm, um, so I don't think there are any other questions. Um, if you didn't have a chance to get your question answered, as I said you can get hold of Stu and Victor um, with their Twitter handles on the screen or you can email bbold at red um, So thank you all for joining today. Uh, we've talked a bit about platforms, microservices, micro platforms, what the benefits are, what the downsides, and a great question about how we actually get started with that. Um, so if there's nothing else, then um, you know, just a thank you from all of us. Uh, our next webinar is on the 18th of January, slightly different non-tech focus of um, just-in-time UX and design, um, which will be very exciting. But other than that, um, Merry Christmas from Rick Badger. That's it from us. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.